On Saturday, I posted this image to my Instagram stories and asked whether or not anyone knew what this spiderweb-like pattern of labeling in the brain corresponds to. And unfortunately, nobody got the answer right. But the answer, it turns out, has very important implications for understanding neural plasticity and how each and every one of our brains works, wires up, and can be changed. So the answer is, this pattern, as some of you recognize, looks a lot like an eye. In fact, it looks like the vasculature or blood supply of an eye. And indeed, that's what it corresponds to. So while this is not an eye, it corresponds to the pattern of vasculature in the eye. Now, it's important to understand that these two things reside very far away from one another. This is the eye of a human. This is the brain of that very same human. And the pattern of this dark label matches precisely with the pattern of vasculature observed in that person's eye. Now, why would that be? First of all, the light sensing portion of our eye is the neural retina, which resides behind this vasculature. And because the vasculature, these blood vessels, and the main artery that feed the eye, do not allow light to pass through them, they cast a shadow onto the light sensing portion of our eye, the neural retina. So therefore, these dark patterns of label reflect the shadows in which we cannot see. Now that's very important because what it means is that for every one of us, we have a fingerprint-like pattern in our brain that corresponds to the areas of our visual field where we cannot see. And every one of us has a different pattern of retinal vasculature, of blood vessels and so forth. And therefore, every one of our brains, even at the level of visual cortex, which is very early on in, in neural processing, is very different from one another. We each truly have a brain that is unique and customized to our experience and to our body. Now, the second important point to understand is really about neuroplasticity. This label, this darker label, something called cytochrome oxidase, you don't need to know that the name of that, it's not important. What, what is important is that cytochrome oxidase labels mitochondrial rich regions of neurons, meaning areas of the brain that are more active than others. So that raises a puzzle. You ask, why would an area in which we are blind, these blood vessels, which we can't see, lead to more activity corresponding to those areas deep in the brain. This is almost the equivalent of having, say, a, a, a finger amputated or something, and then having a greater representation of that finger as opposed to a lesser one. So that's the puzzle that we need to resolve. And it turns out that the puzzle can be resolved by virtue of the fact that these darker areas are a compensation of sorts for the areas in which we can't see that's filled in by the other eye. Now, this is very important because I've talked on here before many times about the importance of vision for setting circadian rhythms and so forth. This is exactly how, for instance, blind people, blind from birth or blind later in life, the area of the brain that corresponds to vision will then be overtaken by areas of the brain that correspond to touch, say for braille reading or for hearing. So they do in fact get enhanced hearing or enhanced touch in the absence of vision. Now this big blob in the middle actually corresponds to the optic nerve head. This is where all the connections from the eye head off to uh, wire up with the rest of the brain proper. So what this means is that for areas of our sensory experience in which we can't see or can't feel or can't smell or can't taste, there's a filling in through some other modality, or in this case, filling in by the other eye. And you can actually do this experiment right now. You can close one eye or cover one eye if you like. And because one eye is covered, it can't compensate for the massive hole in the visual field that you have in the open eye, which is called your blind spot. But you don't experience a blind spot if you cover one eye. You don't experience a blind spot or a hole in your visual field for two reasons. One is that the open eye is making little tiny movements with what we call micro saccades. So you're constantly filling in that blank area. In addition to that, your brain is constantly making guesses it's inferring about what ought to be in that blind spot based on what's around it. Now, this is remarkable because you could even look directly at somebody's face, cover one eye, and you won't see a big hole in the middle of their face where you're blind. Instead, what you will see is a very accurate representation of what their face actually looks like. 
showing once again that the brain is a predictive machine. It has no knowledge locked deep inside the skull of what's outside there in the world, except what the eyes tell it, of course, the eyes being the only portion of the brain that are outside the skull. So three important lessons here. One, everybody has a brain that's uniquely wired to their, not only retinal vasculature, but to their unique experience. Our brains are truly different from one another. And even on the two sides of the brain are quite different because the pattern of retinal vasculature in the two eyes is quite different. So that's important to take into consideration. Perhaps when two people don't understand one another, you have to understand you're actually working with two different levels or qualities or types of wiring. And there's no judgment there of better or worse. They are truly different neural architectures. The second is that neuroplasticity comes about during development when these shadows are cast onto the retina and our brain rewires. And what this tells us is that the brain, even in the absence of deprivation, like an amputated limb or something drastic like that, the brain is wired to reflect whatever it is that's unique about you, is stamped like a fingerprint into your brain. And then third, there is great compensation for any areas in which we lack sensory experience. In this case, the shadows cast by blood vessels make these areas of the brain completely unable to see what's coming in through that eye, but there's a compensation through the other eye. And there's a filling in by guessing. The brain is constantly guessing what ought to be there, what shape, what color, what form, what speed of motion, what facial expression. And so much of our experience is directly linked to the outside world and much of our experience is inferred and guessed by our brain. Our brain is a guessing machine. It's a very good guessing machine on average, but it is indeed a guessing machine. I'm sorry nobody got the answer right. A couple of people came close saying that it looked like an eye, but no one got it quite right. I'll hold a few more um, contests, if you will, like this in the future. Uh, maybe I'll make them a little bit uh, easier. Um, I wanna just, uh, give a nod again to Dan Adams and Jonathan Horton who, who did this work and prepared these beautiful specimens uh, for folks like me to share. All right, more posts coming soon on neuroplasticity. Wishing you well.